New Year's Eve, Johannesburg. Rwanda's former intelligence chief is on his way to an expensive hotel. He's going to see an old informant. It was his friend. I mean, he used to come and stay in his house many times. Patrick Carragher left his car in the car park at Michelangelo Towers and made his way up to suite 905. His family would never hear from him again. His phones and everything started going off from 8, 9 o'clock. And that's when they murdered him. The friend, a man by the name of Apollo Kiririsi, was used as bait. The killers themselves are thought to have rented a suite across the corridor. We don't know how many of them there were. We do know that Patrick Carragher seems to have put up quite a fight. The, the room was a mess. Uh, there was a bit of scarf where you can see everything was just a nightmare. And we found the, the towel, you know, and the towel was full of blood and the rope, you know, the, the, those cutting hangers. He had marks all over uh, here. So literally they used the rope. Uh, to hang him tight. His face had, had turned charcoal black. Patrick Carragher was once one of the most powerful figures in Rwanda, Paul Kagame's chief of external intelligence. Our oh, dear, good friend. He fled to South Africa in 2008 after falling out with the regime. There he helped set up an opposition movement called the Rwandan National Congress. His friends and family are in no doubt that he was murdered on the orders of the Rwandan president. What I know is, yes, given his position, the way he was and the way he did his job for all those years when he was part of the Kagame regime, uh, he may have known things or he may be in a position to know things. Almost certainly, Colonel Carragher would have known some dark secrets but his murder may have had more to do with whom rather than what he knew. Patrick Carragher may have been an exile, but he still had friends inside Rwandan intelligence. Now to Paul Kagame, those contacts could possibly have constituted a threat, but to others, they were an asset. Newsnight has learnt that from around the middle of last year, Mr Carragher held a series of meetings with South African and Tanzanian military intelligence. The meetings happened at night, and in secret, and they took place just as South Africa and Tanzania were sending their troops to Congo to fight a Rwandan-backed rebel group. The group was formed in early 2012. It called itself M23. Within months, they had the much more powerful Congolese military on the run. The United Nations said the rebels were receiving support from Rwanda. But in mid-2013, a new UN brigade made up principally of South African and Tanzanian soldiers began taking the fight to the rebels. And by November, M23 was defeated. Their demise had been even swifter than their rise. Could Patrick Carragher's late-night meetings have contributed to the defeat of a Rwandan proxy army? And could that in part, at least, explain his death. Shortly after the murder, Rwanda's president did little to distance himself from the killing while officially denying any involvement. It's a matter of time. Patrick Carragher's death served as a stark warning to his fellow exiles in South Africa. For one in particular, another high-ranking former official in Paul Kagame's entourage, General Kayumba Nyamwasa. Well, the general is understandably perhaps very cautious about his security, about who he meets, about giving out contact numbers, but we have managed to get hold of an intermediary and we've arranged to meet them at a hotel just outside Johannesburg. We'll follow you. Uh, we're just in that uh, grey Toyota over there, oh. so we'll follow you. Okay. Just wait for me. Okay, okay. thanks. 
Six men, three of them Rwandan, are currently on trial in Johannesburg, accused of the attempted murder of Kayumba Nyamwasa in 2010. Since then, he's survived two more assassination attempts, the most recent earlier this month. And so the general is in hiding, living under South African state protection. I ran away from danger, and I ran away from somebody I thought was going to harm my life, and that's the president of Rwanda. He said that uh, Patrick and I uh, are like flies, and if it requires him to use a hammer to kill a fly, he will do it. You knew President Kagame well. Did, would, would you have called him a friend at one point? No, never. First of all, he's a very violent person. And, uh, have you seen that? Oh, yes, many times. Beating people uh, very many times in my life. Yes, I've seen him doing that. In the aftermath of the genocide, in which 800,000 mostly Tutsi Rwandans died, Paul Kagame's army was accused of carrying out mass killings of Hutu civilians. This is an accusation he has always rejected. But General Nyamwasa, who was chief of staff of the Rwandan Armed Forces, admits that what he calls excesses did occur. There was no deliberate intention as to go and carry genocide against the Hutu. But talking about people dying in the war, and particularly some Hutus dying in the war, undoubtedly yes, they did. But these excesses of war are not only confined to Rwanda and not to the RPF. But do you think Paul Kagame may fear what you have to say about those killings, you those excesses? As you, you, you know what? The issue is that you say nobody died. And yet people know either a parent, a wife, or a child died. The circumstances under which people died should be explained. And if they explain, then we can be able to talk about internet conciliation. Because in Rwanda, we don't have angels and, and devils. We may have a situation that is there in between. And you, you are not an angel? No, 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 no. Not at all. Not at all. The South African government this month expelled four Rwandan diplomats, linking them to the murder of Patrick Karagea and the attempted murder of General Kayumba Nyamwasa. Well, we were invited here to Pretoria to interview the Rwandan High Commissioner, but I've just been inside and the man seems to have changed his mind. He refused to comment on any allegations of assassinations or attempted assassinations. And to my questions as to whether somebody in this diplomatic mission had been going around intimidating Rwandan exiles, he refused to either confirm or deny it. But almost every member of the Rwandan opposition we met spoke of being threatened. One name came up again and again, that of one of the expelled diplomats, First Councillor Didier Rutembesa. Yeah, physical threat, uh, like I told you, I told them that uh, they will eliminate them. Eliminate? Yes. Didier doesn't uh, hide his words when he's talking to Rwandans, he's straightforward. When he says uh, eliminate, uh, wipe or silence, he means it. Other exiles have played us audio tapes in which, they say, serving members of Rwanda's armed forces can be heard plotting to kill Mr. Karagare. We haven't been able to independently verify the authenticity of these recordings, but it's clear that the South African government believes Rwanda was involved. And it's not just South Africa. Over the years, Paul Kagame's opponents have been targeted in countries as diverse as Mozambique, Uganda, Kenya, even Europe, Belgium, Sweden, and indeed the United Kingdom. In 2011, three Rwandan exiles were warned by British police that their lives were in imminent danger from the Rwandan government. We've spoken to one of those exiles for this investigation who says that he still remains in regular contact with the Metropolitan Police. If Rwanda is trying to silence its critics abroad, then the situation inside the country is tougher still for those who oppose the government. You know, there have been a lot of disappearances, there have been executions, and nobody's talking. So when people are quiet, because the army, the police, the intelligence is all over the place, it doesn't mean that stability. That is terror. If you terrorize people and nobody's talking, that's not peace. Actually, what you have in Rwanda is a brewing conflict that is likely to develop into another conflict. Rwanda has accused South Africa of harboring terrorists, amongst them General Kayumba Nyamwasa, 
and has asked for his extradition. That's unlikely to happen. Despite the denials of official involvement, the message from Kigali seems clear. Oppose us and you're likely to end up dead.